name is Barbara Lesh McCaffrey. I'm the president of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide, and it's an honor to be introducing the annual Sylvia G. Sucker Memorial Lecture. And if you could put the first, great, thank you. Sylvia was born in Brooklyn, New York in July of 1912, the child of immigrants from Berlin and the Bialystok area of Russia. At the age of four, she contracted polio, which affected the left side of her body, and many years later led to post-polio syndrome. But the experience seemed to strengthen rather than diminish her throughout her very long life. She went to Brooklyn College, studied speech therapy, and later pursued a career in teaching. In 1936, she married a man whom she met in college who had been born in Poland and grown up in Vienna and immigrated to the United States at the age of eight. In 1982, after his death, Sylvia moved to Santa Rosa. An event commemorating the Holocaust held at SSU in this, actually it was in what is referred to as the Commons, which is no longer used for that purpose. Um, in 1983, the then university president, Peter Diamandopoulos, was a keynote speaker. After the event, he challenged Robert Harris, who was that year's coordinator, to do more than just memorialize the Holocaust annually. Harris asked a number of people to assist him in responding to the challenge, including Sylvia Sucker. We'll hear more about the founding of the Alliance at the upcoming Robert L. Harris Memorial Lecture on April 3rd. Sylvia was not only an active member of the Alliance and the planning committee for the annual community-wide Yom HaShoah commemoration for many years, but encouraged local Holocaust survivors to tell their stories to students in local middle and high schools, a tradition which is now part of the mission of the Alliance's education committee. Last year, members of that committee supported Holocaust and genocide survivors and their descendants in speaking to close to 3,000 students and 1,000 teachers in Sonoma County schools about the impact of intolerance. We're also indebted to Sylvia for her amazing skills in creating an endowment name for former SSU faculty member, Alliance board member, and Holocaust survivor, Paul V. Benko. After Paul's death in 1999, Sylvia almost single-handedly contacted members of the community to create a fund in his memory, the proceeds of which are one of the major sources of the annual funding for this series. In an interview in 2003, she said, you know, life is full of little quirks and twists. You may get thrown for little, but then you've got to strain up, brush yourself off, and go on. Sylvia died on June 26, 2017, just short of her 104th birthday. She continues to inspire us, and we are so pleased that her daughter, Sahib Amar, is with us today. It is also our tradition to remember any Holocaust survivors in the community who have died in the past year. This year we'll be remembering four survivors, Evelyn Valerie Fielden, Regina Marvan, Ruth M. Turner, and Isaac Zeidlin. And you will hear each of their stories of survival were unique and hopefully find threads with the readings that you're doing. Evelyn Valerie Fielden was born in Berlin. Her parents, who were Jewish, had her baptized, as she said, to give her a worry-free life in Germany. Not quite what was uh, hoped for. In 1935, she waited to join the Nazi League of German Girls. And when her mother had to sign the papers, Evelyn says, she told me I could not since we were Jewish. That was the first time I was told about my heritage. She managed to finish high school at a private girls' school and then emigrated to England with her sister in 1939. There the mother of a school friend took them in. 
Her parents were able to leave Berlin in 1941 and travel to Moscow through Siberia, China, and Japan. In Yokohama, Japan, they managed to get on the last steamer to San Francisco. It was three months before Pearl Harbor. Evelyn came to San Francisco in 1941 and many years later began to volunteer for the Holocaust Center in San Francisco as an interviewer and on the speakers program. She was also a long-term supporter of the Alliance. Her advice to others was to make the best of every situation and don't complain. She died on October 8, 2017. Regina Marvan was born in Munkax, Hungary. In 1941, when the roundup started, she moved with her parents, brother, and sister to Budapest on false papers. They left the family refinery business behind, but the engineer who was left in charge reported them to the Gestapo, and the family was arrested and locked up in the same Budapest prison where Adolf Achman was in charge. There, she interacted with two notable figures. Regina, who was a very brave woman and spoke fluent German, requested Eichmann's permission to get her clothes left back at their lodging. And amazingly, two German soldiers escorted her back to her home to get her clothes. Hannah Senisch, the famous resistance fighter, and her mother were also at the same prison. Regina, who also spoke Hebrew, spent each day walking the allowed 20 minutes in the courtyard with Hannah and got to know her well. Coincidentally, Regina's mother shared a cell with Hannah's mother. Regina and her family were released from prison later that year and were interned in a labor camp when the Hungarian Arrow Cross, the local fascist organization, came into power. After the Russians liberated Budapest, she left Hungary, went to a displaced persons camp in Austria, and it was there she met her future husband, Fred, also a survivor. She, her husband, and her young son, Robert, and the surviving members of her family came to America in 1947, moving to Santa Rosa in 2007. At the age of 93, Regina said she regretted no longer being able to go out and tell her story in the schools, something she had done for very many years. Regina died at the end of October 2017 as a result of smoke inhalation from the fires that swept Sonoma County. Ruth L. M. Turner was living in Berlin during the 1930s. After Kristallnacht, her father felt that it was no longer safe for Jews to remain in Germany. By 1938, most countries had closed their borders, except Shanghai, China, where only a passport was needed for emigration. It took a year of effort and bribing bureaucrats for Ruth's parents, maternal grandmother, and her father's brother and sister to be able to escape. They left for Shanghai in 1939, when Ruth was just two years old, and lived there for 10 years in a small ghetto cramped with 20,000 other Jews. Filth, squalor, and extreme poverty characterized conditions in the ghetto. Her father, who was a tailor, eked out a meager living for the family. In 1949, Ruth became ill with typhoid. Luckily, penicillin was coming into wide use, and her father was able to bribe doctors to get this new medicine and save her life. Eventually, the family was able to emigrate to Montreal in Canada, and then in January of 1951 to San Francisco, at which time Ruth was 13. She credits love, support, and positive attitude of her parents for getting her through the challenges and some of the hard times that she had to face. Besides family, her friends, her Jewishness, and her temple, were all important supports and mainstays of her life. She died in June of, 19, of 2017. And last, Isaac Zeidlin was born in a small town in Poland 
which is now in Belarus. His, his um, brother Ben and his father Solomon went into hiding after their town became a ghetto. The Russian partisans helped them find places to hide, mostly in people's barns. And they found a spot for their mother, sisters, and an infant, a, a, new, a newborn. But when they went back to get them, they discovered they'd been killed less than 10 days earlier. The three family members hid for almost two years. For a time after the war, Isaac was in a displaced persons camp and then went to Israel in 1948 at the age of 18, joined the Navy, and fought in Israel's War of Independence. Isaac came to this country in 1952 and married his beloved Trudy. They operated a coffee shop in Marin County for 29 years. Isaac's advice for people is to be proud Jews, be an example, study, and work hard. He died on January 30th, 2018. May their memories be a blessing. Thank you. Well, we're very pleased to welcome another new face to our lecture series. Professor Rabinovitz is an Israel Institute teaching fellow this year at Sonoma State. He received his doctorate in international relations at the University of Haifa. And his research fields there were American foreign policy, Israeli foreign policy, and U.S.-Israeli relations. He's been a visiting professor at Emory University the London School of Economics, and the University of Haifa. Professor Rabinovitz is currently working on the concept of autonomy for Palestinians in the occupied territories and the role of U.S. guarantees to Israel in peace processes since 1967. His book on Menachem Begin and the peace process with Egypt will be published soon by Indiana University Press. Today, he's going to speak to us on rescuers and survivors in the Israeli context. So please welcome him. So good afternoon, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this to participate in this uh, distinguished uh, lecture series. I regret that I can't attend uh, the lectures throughout the year. I, uh, throughout the semester, I'm actually teaching usually uh, in parallel. This is uh, just to say that I hope that what I'm presenting here is uh, uh, resonates or, or in contact in uh, connection with the other lectures that you have uh, heard before. Um, this photo which now is in the background, uh, <laughs> is a random photo that I found from last year's uh, Holocaust Memorial Day uh, ceremony at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Uh, this is the part where uh, Holocaust survivors light torches, and they're usually uh, uh, escorted by uh, family members. If they just have uh, someone, let's say a grandson who was a soldier at that time, that would be the best photo uh, for them. Uh, as for, for Israel to see uh, the, this connection between surviving the Holocaust and then becoming uh, soldiers, uh, I mean, their descendants become soldiers in, in the Israeli army. Um, what I will uh, do today is I will briefly uh, uh, refer to both Holocaust survivors and, and their rescuers in the Israeli context, which is a bit complicated because, as you know, the Holocaust did not happen in what is now the state of Israel, right? It happened in a different continent, uh, was spread all over. It's not something that you can, uh, uh, that you say, let's say like in Rwanda, that if they have, they have their memories, it's in, their, in that territory, in, that in their land. It's a bit different, it's more complicated. So the first question that I uh, uh, think we should ask is, what was the Holocaust? So I'm not going to uh, get into the definitions uh, uh, and uh, how, why the Holocaust is so unique in, in this uh, uh, study of genocides, right? This is a unique case. 
Um, but certainly there are different views that need to be, uh, to be addressed. And in the Israeli education system, usually, I mean, uh, pupils will learn about the Holocaust era from 1933 to 1945, which is Hitler's years in power, which is everything. I mean, all of that time, which is untrue, right? Because the Holocaust actually started only during World War II, not even at the very beginning, but took uh, uh, into 1940, even if you want to push into only 1941, when the systematic uh, uh, mass murder of Jews uh, had begun. But if you take it from 1933, it means it's, there's a, a build-up into this, right? In, into pre preparing perhaps the, uh, the Germans and others uh, to this idea or this philosophy of killing uh, other human beings just because what and who they are. Um, so usually the Holocaust itself is, uh, is uh, uh, I guess, is uh, defined as the systematic mass murder of, of Jews by Germany. Usually, I guess, uh, you should uh, narrow it to 1941 to 1945 or 44, uh, into uh, the beginning of 1945. Um, how many people perished during the Holocaust is a delicate question. Um, the exact number is actually not known, I think, to anyone. That's part of the problem. Uh, many communities were not recorded well in their countries. Therefore, we know that, let's say, a whole town was wiped out, but we don't know how many people, we don't know their names, we don't know anything about them. We just know that there was a community that's no longer there. Um, and surprisingly, perhaps, in Europe, into well into the 20th century, there were issues I with documenting uh, themselves. Not everyone were German. Um, now, um, so very quickly, you, uh, the Jewish uh, people and the Israeli later the Israeli establishment have uh, um, settled with the number six million, six million Jews who perished, and that was uh, the calculation was about one third of the people. Actually, if it's six million, it's a bit more than one third of the Jewish people of that time before the Holoc before uh, World War II. Um, researchers have tried to. Uh, uh find out a bit more, to dig into this and to be more accurate. And there seems to be a consensus now of between 5.5 million to 5.8 million uh, Jews who, 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 were, who uh, were murdered during the Holocaust. Um, in any case, however we calculate this, we're talking about about one third of the Jewish people. And uh, many people do uh, notice that until this day, 70 plus years later, the Jewish people had not yet recovered demographically from from the Holocaust, um, so it takes it takes time, uh, and um, but certainly most of the European Jewry had been uh, exterminated during the war. I mean, if we're taking let's say only Poland itself, where there were before the war about 3.3 million Jews, which were about 10 percent of the population, surviving the Holocaust, you have only about were about. 300,000, which is about 10% of that population. That's all that is left of the Jewish uh, population in Poland. And they were perhaps the largest community, Jewish community in the world of that time. Um, and there, there's a question of who is considered a victim? That's a big question, right? Who is a victim of Holocaust, of, the, of, the, of, this, uh, uh, of this crime? Anyone who, is ki who was killed? I guess so, yes, that's logical. But anyone who died during World War II or during the Holocaust years, do they, everyone uh, uh, get that uh, um, uh, status of a victim? Perhaps not everyone, not, uh, not all. Of course, there are those who fought, right, uh, the partisans, those who actually went underground and, and fought and were killed in, in combat with Germans or with their associates, fine. So there's a, it's a bit of a complex, but everyone together are usually uh, referred to together as, uh, uh, or remembered together. Um, and then comes the other question, which is who is considered a survivor? I mean, okay, you talked about the, the victims, now let's talk about the survivors. So, obviously, uh, this is a very sensitive question that is being asked uh, for many, many years. Um, And quite surprisingly, in Israel, in recent years, uh, people have noticed that there are more people who are now referred to as um, uh, survi Holocaust survivors than e a year before. How can that be? Bi biologically, it can't work, right? So obviously, 
definitions changed, right? People, uh, the definitions, the legal definitions of who had survived, uh, the rule uh, for defining people have changed. Uh, therefore, nowadays, let's say, it's no longer only those who were in the camps uh, survived the, s the extermination or concentration camps or labor camps, but it's also those who were under the regime any how any way you uh, under the uh, German regime or any of its associates regimes. So you have a lot you have a lot of uh, um, a lot of people that suddenly added to this. There also is I didn't I think I didn't mention this, but there's a, uh, the community from North Africa uh, that there's a big question there: Are they part of the uh, the Holocaust or not? I mean, have they so certainly there are people Northern African Jews who were deported to uh, uh, camps in Europe. And some of them certainly have been exterminated. They are Holocaust victim, victims, for sure. But the communities themselves were either, let's say, under it, um, um, fascist Italy or under uh, the Vichy uh, uh, regime. In let's say uh, in that's in Africa, that's in uh, Asia. You have uh, um, uh, Syria and Lebanon. Are they part of the Holocaust or not? Uh, of, this, uh, of the amount of, of people uh, who suffered? Or not, this is a big question that uh, is in debate between uh, between researchers. Um, so now uh, I would want to talk about uh, Holocaust survivors in Israel. After 1945, uh, there was a, a wave of immigration to first mandatory Palestine, and once the British left and Israel was established into the state of Israel, um, whoever survived and could manage, uh, people uh, came mostly from Europe, I mean, uh, the, this wave. Most of them are Holocaust survivors, whoever is left. Um, of course, there are many who moved to the United States, to Australia. Some uh, prefer to stay in Europe, even go back to the state to where they lived before the Holocaust. Um, but many decided we're going to Palestine, to Eretz Israel. That's our goal. So some of them came legally. There were certificates. I mean, the British were in charge in, in Palestine, and they gave certificates per year. Under American pressure, they increased the number, uh, although the American uh, Truman tried to force uh, the British to allow everyone immediately in. They said no, um, but they did give uh, certificates. So a lot of people did come legally. A lot of people came legally, but not with their certificates. Uh, and a lot of people came illegally, either smuggled the, the border or, uh, uh, you know, swam, almost swam uh, to, to Palestine into a beach that the British patrol wasn't there. I mean, uh, that's how they were. And then immediately they would be running into the kibbutzim, in one of the kibbutzim, and uh, uh, disappear there uh, until they, I guess, learned enough Hebrew to sound uh, uh, natural. Um, so you have lots of stories about that. Of course, there are those who were uh, arrested and, uh, t I mean, captured when they came to Palestine and were sent to new concentration camps now in Cyprus, uh, British camps, including my, uh, my grandmother's uh, brother and sister who were sent there and only later were allowed uh, to come to Israel. Um, they came from Marseille. Through Marseille, actually, and uh, also my grandmother and my late grandfather did the same. Came from Marseille. Um, so the nat and the natives, the Jewish natives of, of Palestine, known as Sabra, yes, like the Humus uh, uh, company, Sabar uh, in Hebrew. This is their. Uh, this is how they're known. Um, they actually at first distanced themselves from these. Uh, from these Jews from the diaspora. They are new Jews, people who actually know how to shoot, who learn how to cultivate the land, unlike those Jews from the, from the Gola, from the diaspora, who don't know any of that. They only learn Torah. That's the image that, uh, that so many people had about them. It took years to, to learn uh, how, uh, how difficult their lives were once the Germans took over, and uh, it's certainly uh, the Eichmann trial in 1961 certainly opened up a lot of, of, of these wounds and allowed Israelis, native Israelis, to learn what happened during the Holocaust, things that they never imagined. I mean, they heard about things, but they never really heard such stories um, uh, told on live radio, no TV then in Israel, live radio um, for, for weeks. Okay, now, um, I mean, the, the image of, the, of these uh, uh, diaspora Jews was that they were led to their slaughter like sheep, and they did nothing. 
That was, of course, not completely true. There were those certainly who, who did not resist, but there were a lot who did resist one way or another. And they, they, there is a bravery here that took a lot of time to, to actually uh, uh, learn and to, and, to, and to get. There was no escape for a lot of people. That's the problem. I mean, the, bo the borders were, were closed and there was no way out. That's, that was a problem. Now, uh, Israel's uh, Central uh, Bureau of Statistics just last month uh, for the International Holocaust Memorial Day, which is uh, January 27, which is the day of liberation of Auschwitz, um, have published that there in the at the end of 2000 2016, there were uh, 186,500 survivors in Israel. As I said, the numbers should go down, but actually sometimes they there are years they go up. Uh, for a while. Um, now, Yom HaShoah, the, Hor the Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel. The Holocaust is unique, as I uh, mentioned before, in the fact that Israel remembers this, a state that never existed when the Holocaust was happening, to its people in a different country, continent, in many, many places. Um, and that is perhaps a bit unique about how Israel uh, uh, feels about this, but of course, a lot of uh, those who established the state itself, the people who were there, who lived through the uh, uh, formation of the state, were Holocaust survivors themselves. So, I mean, they have a, they have a direct connection here. Um, now, of course, the Holocaust itself was very present in Israel. I mean, if there's anything that people, that pupils learn in high school, in history, if anything they should remember from high school is the Holocaust. I mean, everything comes down to the Holocaust. The whole Jewish history of thousands of years disappears. Nothing is there. Uh, the, if there's something, especially now, the government, this government is investing quite a lot in teaching about the Holocaust and intensifying this. And there is some uh, outcry in Israel about why are you teaching about the Holocaust five-year-olds or six-year-olds? I mean, they can't uh, absorb any of this. Why? Well, th but this is part of teaching uh, these young, very young uh, people about their, the history and, of course, with some political uh, 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 reasoning behind this teaching. Um, so certainly this is something that uh, should be, uh, should be uh, uh, remembered. Um, now, in the Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel is between Passover and Yom Atzmaut, Independence Day, just in the middle. After the second holiday of Passover and a week before Memorial Day and Independence Day, of course, the symbolism cannot be missed, right? Israel survived. The, is the Jewish people survived uh, Pharaoh, okay, Egypt, then survived the Holocaust, and we have now a state of our own. This is you can't, you just can't miss the, the symbolism uh, here. Now, in fact. This is not the first date of, uh, this is not from the very beginning of Israel that this is the date of uh, Memorial Day. It, ha it starts uh, actually uh, only 1959 when the law made this date, which is the uh, 27th day of Nisan, uh, into uh, uh, the Holocaust Memorial Day. In 1949 already, the first time Israel as a state, as a new state, was trying to uh, commemorate the Holocaust, it was done on the tenth day of Tevet, which is one of the these fasting days uh, in, in remembrance of uh, the fall of Jerusalem, the, the siege and then fall of, of uh, Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem, uh, which became a general Kaddish day for all of those who died. But it didn't really work out because then uh, there are a lot of memories with the same day, and at some point the government, the, the country decided we need a separate day for uh, Holocaust uh, uh, remembrance. So uh, this is how uh, uh, the date was later chosen. It's part of uh, the uh, story behind the ghetto, uh, the Warsaw ghetto uh, uh, uprising. Um, they thought perhaps at the beginning, but that was eve of Pesach, so it's not good. So they moved uh, two weeks later, and this is the date that they decided will uh, commemorate the Holocaust and heroism. It's always Yom HaZikaron LaShoah V'Gvura, Holocaust, and heroism, never Holocaust alone. Just we make it short into Yom HaShoah, but it's not really that. It's commemorating also the heroism uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, 
So this is how uh, the this day begins. Uh, these are images from the central uh, uh, ceremony at Yad Vashem, which is the Israeli institute that commemorates the Holocaust. It's there from 1953. Um, this is a national ceremony, therefore you see soldiers uh, as part of it, and uh, Holocaust survivors, six Holocaust survivors, will uh, light, as long of course that, as there are uh, uh, survivors uh, around, they will be lighting the torches, uh, commemorating one million Jews, every one of them. Um, and you hear their story, how they survived the Holocaust, what happened to them. And as I said, usually they are, associ uh, they are as escorted by a, a member of their family who helps them with the torching um, later. So uh, this is how it begins, at start sharp at 8 p.m on the eve of uh, uh, the Memorial Day. And then you have different ceremonies. So this is the beginning, it's a long ceremony, the heads of the state are there, uh, prime minister, president gives speeches, the chief rabbis, always two, right? Ashkenazi and, and Sephardic, you can't have only one. Um, they uh, give the uh, Kaddish and the uh, El Malay Rachamim, and then uh, you have the, the ceremony of uh, lighting the torches. All entertainment uh, facilities are closed on that evening in Israel uh, by law. I mean, it's not uh, voluntary, it's by law. And then the next morning at 10 a.m., there is a siren for two minutes all around the country. Everyone stands for two minutes, and then there starts this uh, 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 ceremony. This is quite new uh, from uh, uh, recent years, that it's called Lechol Ish Yeshem. Every person has a name, after a famous song by uh, Zelda. Uh, saying everyone has a name given by uh, by his parents, by by uh, by their surrounding, by their God, and so on and so on. This is where people say the names of Holocaust survivor, of uh, Holocaust victims of their family, uh, from their own family. Uh, very similar to perhaps how we started here, uh, remembering people who died just now. So, uh, but then of course those who uh, who are victims of the Holocaust. Um, all of the leaders of the state, uh, uh, most of them are Ashkenazi, so they have personal connection with uh, with uh, uh, with the vi with victims. And the day ends uh, with another ceremony at Kibbutz Lochamei Getaot. Lochamei Getaot is the ghetto fighters, in English, of course, established by ghetto fighters who survived this and came to to uh, to Palestine and then Israel. And usually, the chief of staff is the one talking there. Um, again, the connection between the Israeli army now and what happened then, I mean, you can't miss the symbolism in any of, of, these, uh, uh, of these events. This is how it seems, the two-minute silence um, uh, of siren. It's a siren, it's a stable siren for two minutes. If there is an emergency, always you would hear the, the media tell you if there is an emergency, you'll hear the siren go up and down, then you know we're in trouble. But if not, then it's a stable two minutes. Uh, as you can see, it can catch a lot of people uh, traveling, so they just stand, get out of their cars, stand for two minutes, and continue driving. That's how it goes. Um, in the train, let's say if they're stuck in the train, they will the train will stop, they will stand, and, and uh, that, that's how it goes. Um, now a bit about how memory is passed in Israel. So we have these ceremonies, these are the traditional ceremonies now, but at some point you know that the last survivors will no longer be with us. How do you continue? So certainly there are people uh, who uh, record their story and then we have them on tape. People who uh, uh, write, who people who just speak, I mean, tell their story to others. But perhaps that's not, not really enough. Now the, the authorities who calculate these uh, uh, things uh, estimate that every day about 40 Holocaust survivors die in Israel uh, per year, per, per day. So it's about 10,000 per year, even more. And um, at some point, biology will, uh, will make sure that no one is here. Now, the ceremonies that I just showed you start losing their impact on the younger generations. Uh, they're, they're quite boring, they could be qu quite boring. Can't say they they are they can be sometimes certainly there is uh, a formality that uh, uh, doesn't really resonate with a lot of youngsters. Therefore, some uh, years ago, seven years ago actually, a, a new uh, project started. It's called Zikaron Basalon. As you can see, uh, this is how it's called also in English. It's like Tikkun uh, Olam uh, uh, when people ask. So how do you say Tikkun Olam in Hebrew? 
from. Okay, it's from Hebrew. Uh, <laughs> so Zikaron Basalon, which is memories in the living room. People started, this is how it started, with a person uh, uh, inviting a uh, Holocaust survivor to their living room and people in inviting people to listen. And this is how it goes, uh, uh, an open discussion in that Holocaust survivor tells his or her story. They listen, it's very intimate, and then they can uh, talk, discuss, sing along, and so on. Um, and perhaps a different way to do the same thing. It ha always happened on the eve of, uh, when everything is closed, you know, there are no bu uh, par uh, pubs and restaurants and so on, and movies, so this is what you have. If not, you just sit in front of a TV and watch the movies that the TV stations are, are uh, uh, presenting or listen to, uh, to the radio. That's all that there is to do. Um, so these are their websites if you want to take a look at them. I'll give you a second to write them down. In English, it ends with O-R-G, in Hebrew with uh, com. Um, and more and more people go into this, go uh, to inviting, okay? And um, this is my grandmother telling her story. This is not a regular living room, okay? This is actually a hall that uh, was uh, uh, given for this, as you can see. Tens of people were there, dozens of people, uh, came to, to listen to my grandmother's story uh, several years ago, and I think she did it more than once, if I remember correctly. Um, this is something that I want to say about this. You know, usually, I don't know how if you have learned already about other genocides, uh, but usually survivors are divided into two groups. Those who don't speak and those who do. Those who do speak about what happened to them, to their families, and those who don't. My grandfather, my late grandfather, was those who don't didn't speak. He never really spoke about anything. It was really difficult to get out of him any story, anything. He was one of, if I remember correctly, nine children, the youngest. He, only he and one of his brothers, his old brother, uh, survived the Holocaust. Everyone else were dead. Um, his older brother was already married in Paris. So, uh, um, I mean, also, of course, came under occupation, but still uh, was, uh, was there. Um, we don't know a, a lot of his ordeal. My grandmother talks. She talks with everyone. She talks with us, the grandchildren. She talks with her uh, uh, children, my, uh, my father and, and uh, my aunt and, uh, and others. Um, she is uh, an endless uh, source of stories of what was going on then, um, things that she remembers from home before, things that she remembers from what happened and how things happened to the family. Um, yeah, okay. Um, now, I mentioned before that um, there, w there are probably something between 5.5 .5 to 5.8 million victims. Yad Vashem, the Israeli institute that uh, commemorates everyone, Shem is name in Hebrew, um, has taken a mission on itself. That's their mission, is to collect the names of the people, the, s the, the, the victims, to know who they were, where they came from, who their family was, know anything about them. The basic information is name, age, where they were from, how they died, where they died. Until now, there are about 4.5 million names recorded, which means there are at least 1 million names no one knows, no one probably will ever know, because no one is there to tell. At actually, this started very early, to starting to collect the names. In the 1990s, in late 1990s, suddenly everyone understood, oh, the, they're perishing, the, the, they're, di they're dying on us, the, the, the survivors, we need to collect, again, the names. So I tell you uh, um, that names are collected, they have a, a, a page you can download, it's called the page of testimony, and you can download it and fill out the names uh, uh, of uh, relatives, neighbors, uh, and so on and so on. These are two, um, uh, two pages course, not coincidence. One is Chaim Yosef Lipman, and the other is Hannah Esther Lipman. They are by great grandparents. Uh, this is a pa these are pages that are online. My grandmother uh, sat with my father, told him uh, the names, and he wrote everything down. As you see, there is a bit of a difference between the forms. One was more uh, was almost exclu exclusively in um, in Hebrew. Then the newer form is also in English, so you have also na uh, information uh, in, in English. Um, so my grandmother provided more than 100 names. 66 of the pages 
are online in the Yad Vashem, uh, in the Yad Vashem uh, website. Um, what they do is they cross list and they make sure that they have the they don't have doubles of the same name. Um, okay. Now you can see here. I doubt that you can actually read this. Um, it says where they're from, who their parents were, whatever is known, um, where they lived. Okay, they lived in Ozovkov in Poland, uh, where they died. Probably Dachau, my grand great grandfather. Probably in Dachau. We're not really sure uh, of what. And uh, it was probably in November 1944. He actually uh, uh, survived for, for quite a while. My great great grandmother, uh, she was killed in Chelemno, and uh, my grandmother knows that uh, to say that it was uh, she was gassed. So this is uh, personal the personal uh, attachment, and also two of my uh, grandmother's brothers who died. One uh, of them died in Auschwitz, probably gassed, but we're not. She wasn't really sure. And the other one died in the ghetto in Lodz uh, from disease that wasn't treated well. Um, so that's that's my uh, that's the personal story. I mean, for her family, she was quite lucky. They were three of the five brothers who survived the Holocaust, and all three of them made their way to to Israel, to Palestine, and then to to Israel. Um, Others have uh, dispersed um, all over. Okay, now this is oh, this is Poland. This is Lodz, okay, the central city of their uh, region, and this is a zoom in Lodz, Ozerkov, and Lynches, where part of the family was from. And then they moved into uh, into. Um, into uh, Ozerkov, and this is where they were caught when the war came, and uh, eventually they were pushed into the Lodge ghetto, and from there to uh, camps and uh, and so on. Uh, my my grandmother was uh, res was uh, uh, liberated from Auschwitz in 1945. This is west of of uh, Warsaw. Warsaw would be somewhere here. This is a part of our family tree. Uh, my aunt and uh, her cousin um, worked on this for a long while, on bringing the story, writing out the story of our family, my grandmother's branch, that is. And they came up with, through my grandmother's memory, and only from her memory, about 500 names. Yeah. Uh, who, I mean, generations back, that is. And all of them, uh, they had a huge sheet that they spread. It was amazing how long it was. This is only one section of it, our section uh, uh, of this whole thing. Uh, but this is uh, how people try to record right now before it's too late to record the history of, of, uh, of us. Now, as I said, um, many communities were completely wiped out, leaving nothing behind. No memory, no no person to tell the story, to remember them even. My grandmother community of Ozerkov had gathered and they built this memorial, um, which is three uh, that you have here, one memorial, two memorial, and the torch in the middle. Um, at the Cholon Cemetery, actually the Cholon Cemetery houses a lot of such memorials for Holocaust, for uh, uh, communities that uh, uh, were striked by the Holocaust. Um, every year during the Memorial Day, the Holocaust Memorial Day, uh, the families gather there for uh, another ceremony. Um, and uh, that's what you see here in the photos from a few years ago uh, when I was there too. Um, and now I want to go to the rescuers. That was about the victims and the survivors. Now a bit about the, uh, the rescuers. Um, it's called Righteous Among the, uh, the Nations, Chassidei Umot Olam in Hebrew. This is actually uh, an, an ancient uh, term in, in Judaism that was revived after the Holocaust to uh, identify people who saved Jews during the Holocaust. Yad Vashem, that's, I, I copied this from the Yad Vashem uh, uh, website. This is their mission. This is what they say, that uh, they convey the, the gratitude of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. You see both of them, right? It's not Israel, in a way, is taking the role as representing the Jewish people. 
um, as it usually does, but here specifically, uh, to non-Jews who risk their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. It grants the title Righteous Among the Nations to the few who help Jews in the darkest time in their history. So what they receive is they receive a medal of thanks, of thanks plus a certificate, an honorary certificate, and their name is commemorated in the Mount of Remembrance, which is part of Mount Herzl, where Yad Vashem is in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, it's, it was true that a tree was planted in their name there, but at some point uh, it was too crowded, so they stopped uh, planting trees because there's no, no place uh, for so many. But they are uh, commemorated there. I mean, okay, that's life. Uh, for better or worse, perhaps. Um, and also they are entitled to have an honorary uh, citizenship of the state of Israel. Um, and some claimed that some, some actually moved to Israel and became citizens of the state of Israel. Now this seems to be, from what I understand, from what Yad Vashem is saying, this is a unique tribute of the victims. No one else ever did such a thing of thanking people who saved even one person in, uh, during the Holocaust. So again, this is what Yad Vashem says. There is no parallel or precedent to, to this attempt by victims to pay tribute to those who stood by their side. The idea is to single out the individuals from the nations of perpetrators, collaborators, and bystanders. Uh, many, of the, uh, many of the nations who were occupied by Germany then turned on their own uh, bro uh, citizens, I mean the Jews, and uh, uh, helped. Uh, get rid of them. Uh, many have, but there are those who, s who uh, certainly have not, and they, these are the righteous. It's always individuals, okay, not groups, never groups. Even if an underground, the French underground or the, uh, the uh, Danish underground had saved their whole community, the Danish, that's what they did, their whole community, they, they can't. It's people, specific individuals. That's the, that's the rule. Now, the project starts from the beginning of Yad Vashem itself, there are four criteria that I found, um, saying that, first of all, it needs to be active participation in, in rescuing one or more. Sometimes it could be one person, sometimes it could be a whole family, or even more. There were people who saved a lot of people. Uh, one person who saved a lot, of, a lot of souls. A real risk, that's important. I mean, you were certainly in danger for doing this, okay? Uh, either your liberty or your life. You need the incentive should be saving the Jews, not getting rich from this. I mean, getting their money or uh, converting them uh, into Christianity. That won't work. It needs to be just saving that soul, that person. And also you need evidence. You need to, to be backed by, by some proof that you indeed did that. So what is happening is how, how do people get to that? Usually they're, they're rescuees. Tho those who they rescued would testify in their name, would put their name uh, to the committee and to ask them to say, this and this saved my life. I want, to, I want you to recognize him as chasidu mot olam, as righteous. This is something that they would need to do. This is why the number that I will show you in a minute probably is not reflecting completely what was going on because there were a lot of people who didn't come forward or didn't even know of this before they died and therefore we don't have the record of, of who saved them. But still. So, the total number that Yad Vashem has, and everyone copies Yad Vashem on that, even the, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, they just cite uh, Yad Vashem, commemorates 26,513 people uh, as of last year, uh, 2017. Uh, most of them were, national, uh, uh, were uh, nominated by the people who, who they rescued and survived, right? They need to also survive uh, the Holocaust and that to, to be able to testify. Um, but as I said, certainly there are more that uh, were not recorded yet and perhaps will be in the future if anyone uh, can trace that, trace that number. So the National Division, I summarized their whole very long table into this table. Um, we see that Poland, now, now there's a whole issue of Polish remembrance, right, and all of that. They had the most, perhaps it's ecological because that's the largest Jewish community of that time, and they, well, there are 6,706 6 people, Poles, who are recognized as uh, righteous, the people who saved someone, uh, at least one, uh, that is. And then you have, uh, you have others, this is the way it's going, and then you have other countries where only two countries with 
three people uh, commemor uh, who are uh, uh, righteous, five with two, and 11 countries with uh, one uh, person who uh, was there. And as I said, as you can see here, I put an asterisk uh, uh, on Denmark because Denmark, they actually, Israel wanted, or Yad Vashem wanted to uh, uh, mention uh, uh, a whole group that was there. They asked not to. So there are only 22 uh, righteous in Denmark, but actually a lot, lot more there. But this is the Danish, uh, the Danish people actually uh, asked that. But you know that the uh, Danish Jewry was saved by Denmark itself. They were sent under the nose of the, of the Germans to, to Sweden. Um, this is how they survived. So this is what the, um, um, they, they received. This is the medal, and this is the certificate they received. Um, an honorarium certificate uh, for thanking them for uh, saving uh, saving someone, and of course this comes down to uh, uh, to this uh, sentence from uh, Judaism: "Kol amatzil nefesh echad, kilu itzil olam umelo." Everyone who saved one life is it as if saved a whole world, and this is the this is the logic behind behind uh, uh, commemorating these uh, 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 these righteous. Um, now, commemoration. I found uh, the interesting that uh, the Israeli Postal Service uh, uh, presents uh, stamps. Um, this is the diplomats. There are five diplomats uh, mentioned here uh, who saved Jews. One of them is from Japan. He's the only righteous from Japan also. Um, and you have a general uh, 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 stamp for a salute. It's a salute for the righteous among the nations. Uh, that was uh, uh, issued. And then I, I want to tell you a few stories that I guess you know some of them. I hope you heard of some of them. Raoul Wallenberg, perhaps, is the most no is one of the most known of them. Raoul Wallenberg, who was a Swedish diplomat, uh, stationed at, at that time in uh, in Budapest uh, in 1944, and he he saved tens of thousands. It was an industry of saving these people, giving them. Uh, Swedish uh, protection and also physical Swedish protection. I mean, putting them, hiding them in Swedish uh, government-owned buildings in, in in Budapest. Therefore, they're not you can't touch them. Um, he started in July '44. This is when he started this uh, this uh, his assignment and his mission. Half a year later, uh, when the Soviet liberators, occupiers, whatever you want to call them came in, they took him, and uh, no one saw him ever, ever again. Um, it's now, it seems established that he was killed, he died, or maybe he was murdered, uh, in a KGB facility outside Moscow in 1947. Just two years ago, the Swedish tax uh, system declared him dead. I mean, that's how you know people die, right? You know, there's nothing more permanent than death and taxes, right? So here, here you go. So that's uh, Raoul Wallenberg. Another, um, he became, uh, because his story was so famous and he was so such a, an impressive uh, 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 person, uh, he became an honorary citizen of the United States. One of, his, one of the people he rescued became an American legislator, and he pushed a bill to make him into an honorary citizen of, the sta of, of this country. Also, Canada, Hungary, Australia, and Israel made him honorary uh, citizen after death, of course. Um, and other places also commemorate him. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of places named after him. Uh, in Israel, there are five streets, if I remember correctly, that are named after Wallenberg. Um, one of them in Tel Aviv also has a statue of him uh, there, which is quite rare in Israel to find statues on the street. Um, another one is Oscar Schindler, that I guess many of you have uh, seen the uh, Schindler's List. Um, Schindler himself uh, uh, was a businessman uh, and, uh, and actually part of the Nazi uh, party who at some point, I guess, uh, calculated it would be cheaper to labor Jews than to labor Poles in the factories that he took over. And at some point, thousands of people, uh, he, he saved thousands of people during the war, uh, even fought off at some point. It was, I mean, it became from profiting from them into uh, actually saving them, regardless of the price that he was paying. And he started paying a price in the Nazi party and in the Nazi system 
because they knew what he was doing. They tried to take the Jews from him, and he actually fought them back. Um, he later, uh, after the war, uh, there was an attempt to uh, make him into one of the righteous. But remember, there's a prophet here behind, so it made a, made a problem uh, for a while. But eventually, he was given that uh, he and his wife uh, received that uh, uh, honorary uh, um, stat status. Um, he died um, and in 1974, and he asked to be buried in Jerusalem. So he is. This is his grave in the uh, in the um, Catholic uh, cemetery on Halcyon, which is an interesting story. Um, and he's there, but people who s who he, he, that he sa that he saved uh, put worked for him uh, on on a lot of issues. And then there's another story, even more perhaps interesting because it's le much less known. This person, his name is Muhammad Helmi. He's an Egyptian. And he was recognized in 2013 as a righteous among the nations, the only Arab to be in that position, in that uh, uh, status. Very interesting. Only a few months ago, his family received the, the, the certificate. It's not that the post was late. Um, they refused. They refused to take this from, a, from an Israeli institute um, until they found some, someone from his family uh, who was already in his 80s who knew him personally and was willing to take to accept this, uh, this uh, uh, certificate from Yad Vashem. But not from Yad, he didn't come to Israel for this. He didn't go to an Israeli institute. Usually, if you need to give this uh, honorarium uh, uh, outside of Israel, it's done by an Israeli diplomat, uh, an ambassador or consul anywhere in the world. He didn't go there. He went to uh, uh, a German institute in, in Berlin. I don't remember exactly where. And this is where he was handed the certificate because it was too difficult politically for them to accept something from the state of Israel. Uh, this is how I mean politics get get involved in uh, in uh, even even in this. Um, he's actually a very interesting uh, figure. He was uh, he he's a, as I said he's an Egyptian. He went to Germany to study uh, medicine and he uh, succeeded. He became a doctor. He had uh, uh, but he was uh, an Arab, which means he was Semite. Therefore, he was in a way persecuted by the Germans. Not exterminated, but still persecuted. He couldn't marry his loved one, who was a German. Um, eventually, um, after the war, uh, I mean, he, during the war, um, uh, he saved uh, a Jewish uh, girl um, and her mother and uh, a few others um, with, a so with some help uh, uh, around. And these people survived, and they wanted to uh, recognize him and eventually Yad Vashem accepted but as you see the family actually uh, delayed this by four years until they someone there was willing to accept this honor um, which is a sensitive issue I mean okay there was also one uh, one person from the Netherlands who received uh, the honorarium and uh, returned it just before he died uh, several years ago uh, he returned it um, in protest on Israel's uh, uh, policy towards the Palestinians, and specifically because uh, in 2014, in the war with uh, with Gaza, uh, several of his uh, uh, family members who are Palestinians died uh, in that com in in that uh, clash. So, in protest, he returned uh, the the honorarium. Okay, again, politics uh, gets uh, gets into into this. Um, I'm coming towards the end. I promise. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick list of commemoration of, uh, of the Holocaust in Israel. You have names of kibbutzim and of other townships uh, named after them. Uh, you have uh, kibbutz Bechomer Geteot, which I already mentioned. Uh, Udim, which is uh, translated into firebrands, I mean the last remains of a, communi of a community. They established, a kibbutz, uh, they established uh, Udim. Yad Chana, uh, we heard here earlier, Chana Senesh, so it's after this is after her. And also, Lehavot Chaviva is after Chaviva Reich, who was also a paratrooper uh, uh, who was captured and uh, killed by the Germans in, in uh, Hungary. Uh, and there are numerous streets uh, named after famous victims like uh, um, um, uh, Janusz Kolchak and uh, others, um, and of course, fighters like Anso Sireni and uh, uh, other um, 
of the leaders of Mordechai Nilevich and other leaders of uh, uh, uprisings against the, the Germans all over. So you have a lot of this commemoration in Israel. There is also a commemoration of the righteous. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg, I said there are streets after him. Jan Karski uh, is also a famous name. Uh, who he, he's the person who told the world about the Holocaust. Um, Oskar Schindler, of course, uh, is very known. Films help, but not just, right? Um, and there are parks like these ones. This is the, uh, the official park in Jerusalem, part of, uh, the, uh, part of Yad Vashem, where all of these uh, 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 people, the righteous, are uh, commemorated in this park here. And this is in the city of Haifa. They also have uh, such a, a, a park. Um, two quick things that I wanted to say, to add here, is with Israel's dealing with the Holocaust, a lot of this happened through trials, trials for... Uh, um, for uh, people who persecuted Jews, right? So we have Eichmann, of course, uh, who was found guilty and hanged, the only person in Israel to be hanged. I mean, there is a law in Israel to, uh, uh, to deal with, with the Nazis and their associates, and he was uh, convicted by this. The judges decided to, to hang him, they could not. They could have not, but they decided to hang him for this. And then his uh, uh, his uh, uh, body was burned, and the ashes were spread outside of Israel's territorial water in the Mediterranean. That was in 1961. This is, is the first uh, uh, time that many Israelis really heard of the of what was really going on there in the, in the Holocaust. And in the 1980s, there was the Demaniuk uh, trial. This is a person that uh, many believed was uh, Ivan Ha'ayom, even the Ivan the, the Terrible, one of the guards, the vicious guards in uh, Maidanek. Um, and uh, this person, uh, who was an American citizen then, was uh, accused for being that. He was put on trial, and he was found not guilty. But then he got in a lot of trouble because through, the, through this, uh, this uh, trial, it was uh, uh, the American uh, authorities learned that he lied to them about what he did during, during World War II, so they took away his citizenship um, and sent him back home, I mean, to Germany, uh, although he's Ukrainian. Um, and then he had trials there, I mean, the attempts to try him there until he died a free man, but not, but no, in a lot of uh, legal trouble because everyone suspected that the Israeli court actually made a mistake and it, it was the person that they were looking for. So this is, uh, uh, these are the only two trials that were uh, relevant. There was one more in the 1950s that has to do uh, with Israel itself. I mean, someone who uh, collaborated in a way with, with uh, uh, the Germans in order to try to save people. That's uh, uh, Kastner, the Kastner trial. Uh, but I did, I, this is not really a part of uh, this story, so I decided not to really uh, mention this. And a quick word about foreign policy in all of this. Eichmann was caught in Argentina in 1961, 1960, sorry, late 1960, by the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence. This is what the Mossad was doing, capturing Germans. Germany was an enemy state of Israel until uh, relations were, uh, were uh, mended uh, and established in the 1960s. Germany was worse to Israel than the Arab states around, um, the, the big devil. And um, he was caught in, uh, in Argentina. Of course, it created a lot of trouble between Israel and Argentina because it was clear that someone hijacked, uh, uh, kidnapped uh, 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 an Argentinian, never mind who he was. He has, has, of course, an alias name, but still, this was an issue. And then Golda Meir, who was uh, representing Israel uh, at that time as foreign minister, said, we didn't send them. You can't prove that, and th that, that was basically it. He, she lied, but okay, that's, uh, that's how, how, it, how, how it works. These are Israeli citizens who did it, but we didn't send them. Um, so uh, this certainly had become an issue between the two countries, and also, of course, there is a whole issue here because Argentina had become a, a house to many Nazis who escaped to Argentina. It was a very welcoming uh, country to them and to their ideas, and this became an issue between Israel and, and Argentina, but this is only one, of course, uh, uh, with 
Germany itself, Israel has uh, the reparations agreement that was signed in 1952, uh, and uh, the Germans, since then, Israel and Germany are warming up to one another, have been warming up until eventually uh, 1965, they established diplomatic relations, and nowadays Germany is one of Israel's best friends in the world, certainly in Europe itself, uh, including uh, um, a major investment that Germany does in Israel in uh, uh, providing Israel with arms, Specifically now, I guess you also hear about this now in the news in the last two years, is uh, submarines, which are becoming seem, seem to be a corruption issue in Israel and therefore trouble, but uh, for the prime minister that is. But uh, this is part of the Germans, Germany's commitment towards Israel, so the Holocaust does become also an issue, certainly a practical issue in Israel's foreign policy, um, for better or worse. With that, I will end. Thank you. Have questions? Hi, at the beginning of your lecture, you talked about how the current administration in Israel has political motivations for teaching the Holocaust a certain way, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Okay, I didn't want to, <laughs> but um, the whole idea now, I mean, I, rem I mentioned at the beginning that the Holocaust Memorial Day is actually Holocaust and Heroism Memorial Day. Since 1977, since Menachem Begin uh, became prime minister in 1977, um, Israel usually uh, presents itself as a victim. So not, not, not as a hero, not a, as a victim here. And this is the position where Israel is trying to get things from the world. We were victims and so on and so on. So this is, in a way, what the system now is trying to embed also in younger generations to tell the story and to tell how, how terrible the Germans were to, to, uh, to the Jewish people and so on and so on in order to uh, continue this, uh, this uh, uh, position of being victims, only victims. This is also, of course, this becomes, and I ended with foreign policy, this of course is a foreign policy position to be in. We're victims, therefore, leave us alone about one, two, or three things, Palestinians, Palestinians, Palestinians. I mean, leave us alone. That's, that's the whole thing because we have been victims here and uh, you owe us in a way, okay? This is, this is how I, I guess uh, uh, I would bring it down um, to that. Of course, it's more complicated, but. You mentioned early on that uh, the kind of the list of survivors has grown in recent years. Is there a particular reason for that, or what's the rationale for that? Okay. Um, first of all, there is some recognition that people who should have been recognized as Holocaust survivors were not. One of the problems was, let's say, in the 1990s when uh, uh, a mass of about one million Jews from Russia came. There were no one million Jews in Russia. There were a lot less, but the government recognized everyone who even had one member of the family ru uh, Jewish. All the family is Jewish. That's a uh, break from the, from the rabbinite position uh, in Israel. The thing is that a lot of them were not treated in the Soviet Union as Holocaust survivors. So suddenly you need to expand that uh, also to people who found their way into the Soviet Union as Holocaust survivors, because they were. Uh, now that's the easy case. Then you have the, the more complicated cases of, let's say, people who 
haven't been through a concentration camp or a death camp or anything, but they just lived th under a regime that either the German occupation regime or under any uh, uh, associated regime. Uh, and then the question is, are they or are they not? Are, were they persecuted? And what kind of persecution will define them as Holocaust survivors? And then, of course, it was also the recognition of the North African Jews, uh, who uh, some of them were deported uh, to, to Auschwitz and to other uh, death camps. And you need to also decide if they uh, meet the uh, eight criteria for becoming uh, uh, recognized as Holocaust survivors. It's not, it's not a clear answer here. And sometimes you need to uh, ask every person what happened to you, not as a community. And of course, I guess you should also, um, I should mention the also the politics. There should be some politics around, right? Uh, where uh, a certain political group is, uh, or a demographic group is, is on the rise, and they would want also to recognize them while before they weren't um, for different reasons. There, there is, I mean, being a Holocaust survivor gives you some, uh, um, I guess, uh, benefits from the government in a way. So a lot of people, as an um, older generation, as they get older, it's, it's, it's in their benefit to be there. I didn't even talk about the treatment of Holocaust survivors in Israel and how some of them are being very poor. About one quarter of them are poor. Um, most of them are very lonely uh, people m in uh, terrible health, a lot of them. I'm not, I'm not getting into that. And there's always every, every, uh, um, every uh, campaign, every election campaign, and probably there will be in the coming year, you can follow that. Um, there is a talk about we need to, uh, to give more, uh, invest more in uh, helping these people, these, the, the Holocaust survivors, getting them more budgets uh, in their last years of life. Well, yeah, that's what they say. Um, usually it doesn't work. Uh, some governments actually do uh, increase the, their budget, but sometimes they just don't have that budget. Uh, for different reasons. So um, that's also part of uh, the question of how many are there and how many, how long does the government still need to allocate money for, you know, into the future until no one is, th is there. And I'm not even talking about the other, uh, another issue, which is all psychological in a way, second generation, third generation. Just think, I mean, my father's generation, my father specifically didn't have grandparents, right? There are a lot of people they didn't have anyone, just their parents. That's all. No family around. They don't know anything you know, like this. And then they start her hearing things. Many of them never heard it directly from their parents because their parents didn't want to talk with them about it. They were mo more open with their grandchildren about what happened to them. I mean, this is a trauma that uh, people find very difficult to, uh, to, to live with and then tell your children about this, about what happened to you. Um, so... There are a lot of stories, and then of course, I mean, this ge second generation will also need to be somehow re is already recognized in a way that needs to be treated uh, one way or another. Um, I mean, mostly psychologically, perhaps. You have a lot of issues uh, with that. Everyone has a story, not only a name. I'm wondering if there is tension between the definitions of survivors in Israel versus the definition the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum uses of anybody whose life was affected by Nazi tyranny, which would include people who were able to escape, um, people who are in hiding, um, people who get out, the children who got on, out on the kinder transport, and how it, it seems that the definition in Israel may not have included those people, and, and how to, is there tension between the two countries in terms of Holocaust recognition? Okay. Um, in a way, it is. There is one. But, I mean, I, I haven't looked into the, into the uh, uh, American uh, uh, definitions, but it does seem that the expansion that Israel is uh, uh, doing in recent years is towards that including more people that actually were affected one way or another by, by uh, the Holocaust. Yes, I guess that, that's the direction. That's how it seems to me.
this is a little bit off topic. I'm sure the polls were very happy to see that they had so many rescuers in your graph, but their recent pronouncements you know, negating any kind of involvement in the Holocaust are rather extreme. Do you think that's a product of the right wing that has emerged in Poland or do to dominate Polish politics over the past six years, or is it really the product of a long-standing tradition of anti-Semitism that has never really wavered? I didn't really want to get into this, but into this, uh, but okay. Um, no, no, because it's too fresh in a way, and it's too. We don't know everything yet. We know only the what's public here, right? Um, and certainly, it seems that the polls now are trying. The Polish government is trying to, in a way, say, it in, in, in a way, it is a traditional poli poli uh, political position that Poland has for many years, that we were victims just like the Jews which is something, I mean, we were victims of Germany. They um, eliminated our country, our state, right? Our state uh, 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 institute. Uh, and also the Jews, I mean, the same. But of course, uh, the uh, professor Dina Porat, the uh, chief historian of Yad Vashem says, no, you can't, you can't do that. I mean, you had some kind of a choice. Jews were stuck there. They, they, and they were also then persecuted, not only by the Germans, but also by you, the Poles. In a way, I think that many people aren't willing to say, and I a bit hesitate to say this, but I guess that if more Poles were bystanders, more Jews would be alive. And then, w w then what happened eventually? Okay? <laughs> because a lot of them collaborated, even willingly, in killing and killing and killing. Um, which is which says, yes, there is a, a standard, uh, uh, I guess, of uh, some uh, anti-Semitism in, uh, in Poland that uh, in a way they haven't uh, addressed. But th certainly the Holocaust is not their doing, that's for sure. That's, I mean, the, the German foreign, po foreign minister tweeted that immediately when this happened. We did it, I mean, they took the whole blame. They d they are doing it for almost 70 years. The Germans acceptance. This is a reparations agreement. We are responsible for this. The Poles, at least many of them, have been collaborating with uh, with them. Indeed, there are a lot who haven't, who have uh, been resisting and risking their own lives by doing that. And I'm sure that the number that I showed here is not everyone, not at all. Uh, some of them have perhaps tried to save, but either died uh, by trying or their the people who s who they uh, say who they saved didn't survive to tell the story so in a way um, we don't know about that but certainly there was bo in both directions I would guess both uh, they were both collaborating that's for sure but also uh, trying to save people uh, around them but oh you know they knew they knew exactly what would happen to if you were caught with a uh, with a uh, Jew uh, that you're hiding you're you're dead and probably your family will die uh, for that so. It's a huge risk that people needed to take. I mean, they deserve uh, respect for, for what they did. But uh, to tell that nowadays the, the, German, the Polish position um, is historically accurate, of course not. It's political. And then the question is, is it just because of the, right, the rise of the right uh, now, or is it more long term? I guess you can find both. Both, both answers will be yes, in a way. Both questions, I think I, I can answer positively. Uh, somewhere th the truth is in the middle, right? Uh, that's how I, I'd feel. In talking about uh, the North Africans, uh, it made me wonder, are Jews in Israel still being taught that the Holocaust <coughs> was a European Jewish tragedy only? Or do they understand that at Rommel 1 in North Africa, there were plans to wipe out the Yeshuv also, and that throughout the war, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was pressuring Hitler to hurry up and put the, the Palestinian Jews higher on the list of victims. Um, my students know, because <laughs> I tell them, 
that it's not only in uh, Africa, no, not only European, um, right? They're here, they can testify, uh, some of them. But um, in a way, I'd say that the, the this fact that it was not only uh, in Europe is something that even for political reasons now, it would be important to tell students that it's not only the Ashkenazi Jewry that uh, was uh, uh, wiped out in a way, it's also from the Sephardic communities uh, that suffered. And that, in a way, again, is politics, because nowadays in Israel, I don't remember exactly the, 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 pr the proportions, but there are certainly more Sephardic than Ashkenazis in Israel uh, for years now. Um, they took over, I mean, demographically. Uh, the Holocaust did, of course, its uh, part in, uh, in uh, shrinking the Ashkenazi Jewry. And uh, therefore, politically, they are on the rise in a way that they also want this recognition. Yes, it's also us. Not only the not only the Ashkenazis, not only the European Jewry. Of course, you see the stories. Also, in in Europe itself, not everyone were Ashkenazi Jews, right? I mean, you have in Greece, the Greek are Sephardic, and other. You know of these stories. You know of all of this. There is no surprise here. Uh, um, but a lot of this is not really uh, was not what was not for many years uh, put on the on the front because there were. Uh, uh bigger, I guess, uh, communities that uh, uh, perished, and that was more important. than nowadays, you, ha you hear more of that, yeah. I guess also in the education system, although I have no connection to it, to the education system, that is, uh, for many years. Hi. So one of the things I notice, I've been aware of, is that it seems like any foreign diplomat or visitor, like president or whatever, who comes to Israel has to go to Yad Vashem. That's true, right? And it has the feeling, so I think about that in the context of this issue now about, you know, the narrative of Israel as being victims, right? Which certainly, it's, you know, obviously, things happen, but I'm just thinking about, I think that's part of also what you're saying. It's sort of like, we want to make sure, whoever you are, wherever you're from, that you know this history. And I can certainly make an argument why that's important. But I think part of the challenge is, is if, if that's the only, if that's the primary identity of Israel, I, th I see that particularly as the years go on of, being harder to maintain as survivors die and children must survive, you know. And I also think that it may be one of the reasons why it's sort of like you've made yourself into identity as a victim from the very beginning. And now when you do things that we think are um, immoral, that are, that are inconsistent, you know, some of the things that, you know, that is even more shocking to people because you've made yourself so much into being victims of horrible crimes and some people now look at things that are happening and say, and you're doing some of the same things. So it's, I guess I'd like for you to speak about kind of the implications for the country of having had so much of their identity caught up in being victims. Um, I agree. This is a prop. This is a problem. This is, as I said, part of Israel's foreign policy to present itself. And indeed, by bringing every uh, every new president uh, uh, who ever comes to Israel to Yad Vashem, is a thing. They know they have to be there. Well, you know the the current American president. How long he was there? And what he wrote uh, in the note? Quite embarrassing. Perhaps he shouldn't have been there. Um, you know, that's. <laughs> but. Um, Others have been, and everyone are there, and they understand indeed that this is part of the Israeli identity. Okay, now that's fine, but sure, there are the implications that say, one thing that I haven't touched here, but I did mention in my classroom when I talked about this, is uh, that Israel sells arms to, peop to uh, countries that some of them are involved in terrible atrocities, domestic and foreign, um, which is a big issue. I mean, this is a moral issue. Is it okay to sell arms? Right? 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 Also? Also that? 
right? And also, I mean, it now Israel has an agreement with Rwanda of all places as a safe haven for those Ar Eritreans uh, that Israel doesn't really want to recognize them as asylum seekers. Um, and then, of course, it comes back to the Rwandan gen genocide and what Israel did or didn't do while, while that was happening. And also, um, the question of uh, arming that country and starting a, an alliance with it. And you see Netanyahu and the Kagame meeting quite a lot and already quite friendly with one another um, on, a on a lot of issues. Um, and actually, it's interesting that a lot of Holocaust survivors have spoken up against the government not to uh, push these people out because of their own personal history and of Israel as the nation, as the, the country of the Jewish people. We can't do that. So there's a whole struggle over this in Israel these these days. The government has its position, but there are a lot of there's a lot of opposition to that to that position. Thank you. Thank you.